Um, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, Dr. Ranjith Ramasamy, uh, Director of Reproductive Urology at the University of Miami. And he will be doing some case presentations on uh, male reproductive endocrinology. Uh, thanks, Tom. Uh, Tom Masterson is my uh, fellow this year, and it's a true honor and pleasure to present uh, to you guys uh, the case presentation on male reproductive endocrinology. Um, thanks to UCSF for organizing this wonderful COVID lecture series, uh, certainly an outstanding effort that uh, several other communities uh, within urology have uh, followed, uh, but certainly uh, an honor to be part of this uh, very select group of uh, physicians that have participated in this lecture series. For those of you that are young and want to reach me, uh, you can follow me on Instagram. It's my last name, MD. Uh, you can direct message me with questions and uh, happy to answer if an email is too challenging. Uh, these are my disclosures. Um, as a plug, uh, unfortunately, the AOA is canceled. Uh, but uh, at the University of Miami, we had about 20 abstracts get accepted at the AUA this year. Uh, so as a way to present this all together, uh, we're organizing a two-hour session uh, this uh, week uh, on Saturday at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time. Uh, if you guys can register and are interested, uh, you're welcome to register on this link and participate with us. There'll be a whole bunch of abstracts and interaction with the authors and some moderators. So we'll start uh, with the uh, first case. The format of this is going to be that we're going to take questions at the end of every case. Uh, Dr. Masterson will uh, peruse through the questions and sort of interrupt me and ask me. Uh, so we'll go uh, case by case so we don't leave uh, people hanging with questions. So 17-year-old Caucasian boy who complains of fatigue, decreased sex drive, uh, inability to see effects from the gym like his younger brother. Uh, he really didn't have any past medical history, no surgeries. Uh, grew up well, didn't have any issues with puberty. His biggest complaint was he just wasn't getting as jacked like his younger brother was. On physical exam, uh, he was healthy appearing, uh, grew normally. Uh, his on GU exam, his uh, bilateral testes were 12 cc. Average testis volume normal is about 16 to 20 cc, and his was about 12 cc on the lower end, uh, but certainly normal secondary sexual characteristics. So as a next step in this patient, the first thing you want to think about is uh, obtaining hormones. And we went ahead and obtained hormones, and we found that his morning total testosterone was 25 nanograms per deciliter, and his FSH and his LH were basically undetectable. This was obviously very alarming when he first got these results, because that level of testosterone is almost castrate. And for a guy that's 17 years old, that low level of testosterone, it's hard to imagine how he could even be uh, functioning okay. And his FSH and his LH were undetectable. Clearly, his brain was not communicating with his testes to produce testosterone. He had, prior to seeing me, gone to see a local urologist who gave him a prescription for Clomid. Uh, we'll talk about what Clomiphene citrate is later on in this lecture, uh, but certainly gave him Clomiphene, and he felt even worse and uh, was pretty much in a panic mode with his parents uh, when they saw me. One of the first things that you wanna think about in someone that has an undetectable FSH and LH is uh, what's happening in the brain. And one of the most important things that you wanna think about is his pituitary gland to see if there are any underlying tumors or any masses that compresses the pituitary that is uh, not producing the FSH and LH. So we got an MRI of the pituitary gland and it was completely normal. And further on, most common pituitary tumor is probably a prolactinoma in somebody his age. And we obtained a prolactin level and that came back at 18 and was also normal. Normal prolactin level, anything less than 25. So his parents, the reason they say a urologist like us as opposed to an endocrinologist is because the parents were interested in fertility preservation. And that's why they were seeing us as opposed to an endocrinologist. They wanted to know if their son could go on to father children in the future. He was mostly interested in gaining his uh, libido, his sex drive, as well as being able to uh, gain muscle mass in the gym. So certainly what we do in the adolescent can impact what happens in the adulthood. Uh, Dan Nasta, my incoming fellow, Kevin and Ruben, two residents at the University of Miami, 
put together this very nice review that we just published uh, last month in Fertility and Sterility, where we need to be thinking about how we can manage these kids at a young age so we can optimize their future fertility outcomes. And this is very important because we want to make sure that we optimize their health and their reproductive health at an early stage so we can obtain the best outcomes when they grow up and are ready to have kids. So before we move on, I'd love to review the HPG axis. I know a few of you are very familiar with this. Most of you may not be. The HPG axis starts with the hypothalamus, which basically makes GnRH, the gonadotropin-releasing hormone. The gonadotropin-releasing hormone basically acts on the pituitary gland to make LH and FSH. LH is luteinizing hormone that acts on the lytic cells within the testis to make testosterone, and FSH acts on the Sertoli cells to support spermatogenesis. The testis, in turn, makes two hormones, or three hormones actually, testosterone, which gets converted to estradiol and negatively feeds back on the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, and activin and inhibin, which act on the pituitary gland to block FSH. Now this testosterone, when given exogenously, and this is probably an important concept that I will stress later on, can get converted to estradiol and block GnRH and FSH and LH. So this is such an important concept that you have to understand the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis for us to understand any male reproductive endocrinology. So let's go back to our patient. His parents were interested in fertility preservation. One of the first things that we do is obtain a semen analysis. Now here, the most important numbers are the semen volume, which was about 1.1 cc, and normals around 1.5 and the sperm concentration, which is the most important number, was half a million, and normals around 15 million sperm per cc, and motility was 0%, and normals around 40%. So pretty dismal news for the family. Not only was the volume low, the concentration was extremely low, and none of the sperm were moving or alive. So obviously compounded to what the kid was undergoing, the parents were even more now afraid that they would not be able to have grandkids. He obviously didn't care about kids. He just wanted to feel better. But now this situation just became even more dire with uh, this sperm analysis result. So now the first thing that you want to understand is what is his diagnosis? You got to pick up the diagnosis in order to manage these patients properly. Now one thing that everybody's going to be thinking about from studying urology is something called Kalman syndrome. And Kalman syndrome basically happens when patients cannot smell. And in him, I can tell you, we went back and asked him if he can smell, and he could. And so his diagnosis is actually non-monosmic, meaning he can smell just fine, idiopathic, meaning we don't have an underlying cause, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. His hypothalamus does not communicate with the pituitary gland, and the neurons that pass from the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland are not functioning well. And so therefore, the FSH and the LH from the pituitary gland does not get released. So if you treat these patients with just HCG, this is human chorionic gonadotropin, or its analog of LH, with 2,000 units every other day, and or add FSH, 75 units every other day, that should be sufficient to recover spermatogenesis in up to 90 to 95% of patients with idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So six weeks after I started him on just HCG, 2,000 every other day, his testosterone level was 478. He started feeling better. He was really happy. Remember, his testosterone level was 25. And so from 25 to 478, he felt a whole lot better and was very happy. His parents were still concerned because we didn't know what was happening to his spermatogenesis. And so we continued the HCG for another six weeks. And the goal in medical therapy for men is to do every intervention for about three months because spermatogenic cycle happens around 70 days and all the interventions you sort of want to plan for doing it for at least two and a half to three months to see any noticeable changes in sperm analysis. So this was the sperm analysis result in three months and this was very fascinating. The semen volume had improved because his testosterone had improved from 1.1 to 3.3. His sperm concentration went from 0.5 to 23 million sperm per cc and his motility 
He had no mortal sperm when we started. I went from zero to 62, 62%, and his total mortal sperm count was around 47 million. So happy news all around. We were able to offer sperm prior preservation to him, which the family happily agreed to. This amount of sperm will be sufficient to perform even insemination cycles, or IUI, where you don't need to retrieve the eggs to do the assisted reproduction. They can use insemination cycles with this quantity of sperm that we can freeze. So in him, he was going off to school and keeping him on HCG every other day was going to be a challenge. So basically what we did was we offered something called testosterone pellets. These are long-term subcutaneous pellets that we place in the office. It takes about five minutes to do, and you can do it every four to five months based on symptoms. So in someone that's young like this, that is probably going to require testosterone therapy for pretty much the rest of their lives, you wanna think about long-term testosterone therapy options. And I do start patients, especially somebody with almost no testosterone, on the higher side of doing 12 pellets, we check their testosterone, hematocrit, and estradiol, looking for polycythemia and gynecomastia effects six to eight weeks after you place the pellets. And then we repeat the uh, testosterone pellets every four to five months based on symptoms and on levels. And so this is the procedure that's used. It's subcutaneous, it's done in the office, and it's fairly straightforward. That's what we did. We had a very happy customer. And it's very important for you guys to understand that these patients are good patients to treat because you can give them medications and you can obtain a very happy outcome uh, at the end. I'd love to take any questions about this particular case uh, before we move on uh, to the next case. Dr. Masterson, do you want to unmute? Yeah. Yes, I am. Um, so yeah, we had one question uh, about why why you just to repeat why you had switched him off of the hcg um, and put him on testosterone certainly so hcg injections need to be done um, usually twice a week or in some rare instances if you're using very high dose um, you can do it uh, once a week uh, but but certainly someone who's going off to school you don't want to be thinking about injecting himself either twice a week or once a week uh, better to put him on testosterone therapy, better to put him on long-term testosterone therapy, something that he doesn't have to be thinking about doing on his own. But certainly if he's happy with HCG, he's okay with injecting himself and cost is not a concern, you can keep them on HCG for long-term. Gotcha. Um, another question. Uh, you mentioned HCG plus or minus FSH. Uh, what would be your indications for starting FSH and why not just start FSH to begin with? That's a great question. I think the, um, usually I use the indicator of testis volume. So you have to understand that testes are made up of germ cells. And if you have a big testis or a good testis volume, that means you know you have good germ cells in there. And in patients who have good testis volume, and usual cutoff that's published is around 10 cc. So men or adolescents with 10 cc or larger, you can get away with just treating with HCG. You don't need to add FSH. Whereas patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism with very small testes, I usually start off with both HCG and FSH together because you need to help support their germ cells as well. So HCG or HCG plus FSH I make the decision based on testis volume, but certainly cost as well. FSH may not be covered by insurance and can be expensive, and that's something that you want to discuss with your patient. Okay. Uh, another question was, how many times did you cryopreserve, or how many times do you need to cryopreserve? So as long as uh, couples can do two or three IUI cycles, I think that's sufficient. So about with 48 million uh, moving sperm, you can probably freeze up to four vials. That'll be good for four IUI cycles. If you certainly want to preserve more, uh, the patients would require more, you can certainly do it. Um, at least you should do two vials. If they have more sperm, uh, the goal is to try and put at least 10 million moving sperm if you put in one vial for a good insemination cycle, or if you don't have enough for an insemination, at least 1 million in every vial if you're planning for an IVF cycle. Along the lines of the sperm banking, um, if the patient is able to make his own sperm, uh, why bank now? Uh, can he regain spermatogenesis if he goes back on HCG in the future? Absolutely. I think the goal when he is ready to have kids 
uh, would be to go ahead and take him off of the testosterone and start him on HCG again. And if he uh, gets back his promatogenesis, I think that would be the best way for him to go ahead and, and have kids. Uh, if, I, think, I think that was the same question before. Can we uh, just keep him on, on HCG now long term? I don't think there's anything uh, wrong with that. If he wants to remain on HCG, doesn't care about the injection or the cost, certainly a good idea. Um, if he wants to switch to testosterone therapy, that's also completely reasonable. Now, I'm, I'm skipping some of the questions around because they kind of are, some are segueing into each other. Um, if he wants to have children in the future and he wants to conceive naturally, uh, what would you do in regards to the testapel um, and, and how would you manage that? Perfect. So I think I would stop, uh, stop the testopel and uh, certainly start him back on HCG and see what his testosterone therapy does and see what his uh, spermatogenesis does in about three months and then determine whether he needs uh, FSH support or not. If his testis volume, again, I would restart the examination and evaluation just like how we did in the beginning. If his testis volume still is more than 10 cc, giving him just HCG alone and seeing what his primatogenesis does is completely reasonable. If his testis volume has shrunk or it's smaller, then certainly doing HCG and FSH together is a good idea. Uh, this is multi-part, so we'll just take them one at a time. But uh, what, first, why did the Clomid make him feel worse? Um, the Clomid made him feel worse because it did not increase the testosterone, right? You need the good connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. You need to have the, new, the, the, the hormones uh, for, of FSH and LH to increase testosterone. But in him, he's missing the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. And so therefore, you give him Clomid, it's definitely not going to increase his testosterone level. So in him, his T level didn't go up. But remember, Clomid is actually an estrogen molecule. Right? It's a CERM. It's a selective estrogen receptor modulator. So by giving, it's almost like giving an estrogen substitute to a guy without increasing his testosterone level. And so it's a double whammy effect, wherein you not only did not increase his testosterone level, you even increased his level of estrogen circulating in the blood. So that's why it made him feel like shit. Okay. And uh, what are, even though his prolactin was normal, what was the indication for an MRI? It's a very good question. So the only time I get an MRI uh, in patients with uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is if they don't have anosmia, meaning you don't have a diagnosis of Kalman syndrome and it's idiopathic, you want to rule out any mass compressing effects, adenomas of the pituitary that are not a prolactinoma, craniopharyngioma, tumors in the pituitary gland that would cause a compressing effect on the LH and FSH so that you're not making enough. So in patients with Kalman syndrome, anosmia, I don't get an MRI. In patients with idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, I get an MRI uh, to make sure you're not missing out any mass lesions in the pituitary gland. Um, you answered some of these. So, uh, ca just causes of idiopathic hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Uh, you mentioned to some parapharyngiomas, uh, problems with the, the pituitary gland. Uh, anything else you to add to that list? Um, no, there's a laundry list of the reasons for idiopathic hypogonadotropic, of which uh, genetic defects are huge. Uh, genetics of, of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism is probably the most well-studied phenotype within male infertility, uh, beyond just Cal1 defects and Kalman syndrome. And so most likely they have to be attributed to some sort of underlying genetic defect. And we'll take this as the last one, uh, just to move on to the next case. Um, is there a detrimental effect if you use testosterone first before you use HCG on spermatogenesis? That's a great question. I don't think so. You know, I've actually debated this question. We've debated this question, Tom. Is we, we, the, the reason, and, and you will learn this in the next two cases, the reason exogenous testosterone therapy affects spermatogenesis is because it blocks the GnRH and it blocks the FSH and LH. In him, there's no GnRH. There's no FSH LH. So giving him testosterone, I think is completely reasonable. It'll be a nice study to do to keep guys on testosterone who have hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and simultaneously treat them with HCG and FSH to see if their spermatogenesis recovers. Because truly they don't have negative feedback and all that you're starting is beyond the pituitary to treat. So interesting concept. I've thought about it. 
So the answer to that is no. I think you can safely treat hypo, hypo patients with testosterone therapy. And I don't think you're going to get long-term downstream adverse effects on spermatogenesis. All right. All right. That was all great discussions. Uh, can we, uh, let's move on to the uh, next case. So it's a 28 year old male with a history of infertility. Uh, he has an unremarkable uh, medical history, uh, no prior pregnancies. His wife is 26 and has a normal workup and the couple is now referred from their reproductive endocrinologist or their gynecologist. Uh, semen analysis shows oligospermia. His concentration is four million sperm per cc. I told you from the previous case, normals around 15 million. Motility is 38%, close to normal, around 40%. Morphology, 5% is normal. That's good, 4% according to the WHO. And volume greater than 1.5 cc, so 3 cc is normal. So low concentration, rest of the parameters look okay. They've certainly been trying for a while and they're now concerned that they're not getting pregnant. And both of them are pretty young. Next steps, one of the first things that we need to do, especially when a couple comes from um, an IVF center, a reproductive endocrinologist or gynecologist, you just have to assume that they haven't been examined. So you should examine them, evaluating them for conditions that could lead to their uh, low sperm count. Number two, you wanna repeat the semen analysis. Uh, WHO recommends getting two semen analyses. Uh, you wanna get the semen analysis from a center that you trust, uh, especially if you see semen analyses from LabCorp, Quest, commercial labs that don't do this on a regular basis, you want to make sure that you get a semen analysis from an andrology lab or an IVF center or your own lab that you trust the results. So we went ahead and did both. And we found that on exam, uh, there was no varicocele, which is the most common correctable cause of infertility. And on exam, there's 12 cc testes. So testes are a little small. Uh, normally told you it was around 16 to 20 cc. We repeated the semen analysis. The volume was 3 cc. Concentration around the same, around 6 million sperm per cc. Motility was a little low this time, around 22% compared to 38, and morphology was 5%. So we have this young couple here. The guy has a little smaller testes, and his uh, sperm count on both occasions shows a lower concentration than normal uh, definition of oligospermia, and certainly low motility definition of asthenospermia. This is obviously a lecture on male reproductive endocrinology, so we're going to get hormones in every patient. So we did get hormones. His FSH was 15, it was a little high. His LH was five, uh, and normals around two to eight. And his testosterone was 244, and normals around 300 to 800. And estradiol was normal at less than 20. So interesting, his FSH is high, sort of indicates impaired spermatogenesis, but his LH is low, and his testosterone is low. And this is important, in the diagnosis here, is secondary hypogonadism. You have to distinguish this from hypogonadotropic hypogonadism because in the first case, there was no GNRH. There was no FSH, there was no LH, and there you were able to give HCG with or without FSH and improve spermatogenesis. In this, he's making FSH very well. The LH is being made just not as good, and his testosterone is low. And the diagnosis here is secondary hypogonadism. This paper was put together by John Masterson, uh, who's now an intern at Cedars. Very nice study looking at testosterone levels and LH levels presenting uh, to our clinic. And we found here on the uh, bottom here, secondary hypogonadism actually was the most prevalent compared to primary hypogonadism or compensated hypogonadism. Secondary hypogonadism is what our patient has. He has low LH and low T, compared to primary hypogonadism, which is what you expect in most men with infertility who have small testes, you would think that the testosterone will be low, and the pituitary would hyperfunction, it'll react, and it'll improve their LH. But in fact, most patients, the pituitary doesn't function as well. The LH is low, and the testosterone is low. So we always think low testosterone is a disease of the elderly, and it's been, um, you know, low T, uh, andropause, um, hypogonadism, testosterone deficiency, so many uh, names given to this as though this is the disease of the elderly. Uh, very nice paper put together uh, by Dan Nasso, Premal Patel, uh, showing that low T can be in adolescents and young adults. 
And Shom Lokeshwar is going to be as a medical student here and he's going to go on to be an intern at Yale next year. Uh, did a very nice cross-sectional analysis using the NHANES data. And we showed that the testosterone levels in adolescents and young adults, so meaning age 18 to 39, we showed that the testosterone levels have actually declined when you look at 1999 to about 2015 to 2016. Obviously, we don't see a decline beyond 2011, but certainly the number uh, declining in this young population, right? Testosterone declining in old people, that's not news. But declining in young people certainly is something to be uh, concerned about, especially given the increasing prevalence of obesity, increasing prevalence of drug use, opioids uh, in adolescents and young adults. We need to be thinking about why is testosterone levels going down? And interestingly, testosterone reference ranges are actually set based on what young people have. Testosterone normal T levels are based on young people blood draws. And if the youngsters are having low T levels, then certainly the ranges will also change. And this is something that we all need to pay attention on. So like I told you, the HPG axis was probably the most important slide that I showed you in the first case. This slide is probably the most important in this case. Again, it's the same HPG axis, but basically describes the different drugs that we use in male infertility. So now that we're all familiar with the HPG axis, we need to understand that clomiphene citrate acts, prevents the feedback of estrogen on the hypothalamus in the pituitary. Remember I said it, it was an estrogen molecule, acts on the estrogen receptor, blocks the feedback. And basically the goal is to somehow improve intratesticular testosterone by increasing LH. <clears throat> it increases FSH, but the goal that you want your patient to get is the increase in LH and increase in testosterone. The other drug that we commonly use is an astrozole. It blocks the conversion of testosterone to estrogen and it's an aromatase inhibitor and basically again increases intratesticular testosterone. That's the goal guys. In medical therapy for infertility, you want to increase testosterone produced endogenously within the testis. Whether that translates into spermatogenesis or not, no idea. You would love and pray that everybody will have improved spermatogenesis, but not everybody responds to all of these drugs the same way. And so that's all you want to know from this slide is your goal of medical therapy for male infertility is to increase intratesticular testosterone. You won't get into a lecture on antioxidants. I'm doing a webinar actually next Friday on um, antioxidants and lifestyle modification. And the last and probably the most important point in this slide that I want to illustrate is exogenous testosterone therapy will block GnRH and FSH and LH and will block intratesticular testosterone production. Until three months ago, I did not have this red uh, word in this slide and I'm going to add a caveat to this that I think this is probably true just of long acting testosterone therapy. Hold on to the thought, we will revisit this later on. So what is Clomid? It's been used in the treatment of hypogonadism. John Mulhall has probably the published the longest study of about 27 patients uh, showing that both satisfaction scores and testosterone levels uh, remain high even uh, with time. I published this when I was at Baylor with Dr. Lipschultz, where we showed that regardless of what the testosterone levels were, the satisfaction scores among men using Clomid, testosterone injections, or gels were still pretty good. You know, you always have these guys that come into the office and say, Doc, I want my T-level at 800, 900, 1000. You know, but then we actually saw that regardless of what the levels were with the T, the satisfaction scores were actually fairly similar regardless of what modality of testosterone therapy you used or if you used Clomiphene citrate. So that's a good idea to tell patients. So just because your levels are high uh, does not mean you're going to be more satisfied. Let's circle back. Who should we give medical therapy to? Very important. You see all the time, oh, the doctor asked me to take some Clomid. The gynecologist gave my husband some Clomid. Um, I told, wife says this, I told my husband to take some Clomid because they gave me some Clomid, right? Clomid gets thrown around so much that we have no idea who to give it, who not to give it, worse, who it adversely affects uh, in. So let's focus the next few minutes exactly discussing what the indications are. So men need to have low serum testosterone or a normal or subnormal LH irrespective of FSH levels. So this is a patient with a low T level of 270 and an LH that is low. And this indicates that this patient would benefit from Clomid 
25 milligrams, half a tablet every other day. And this is very important because this is exactly uh, a half a tablet because you don't need to give a full dose that is done in the females. Let's switch the case around a little bit. In this patient, this is a classic patient with Klinefelter syndrome where his estrogen is very high and the T2E ratio changes to 2.7, but his LH is low and his testosterone is low. And so in this patient, you would treat them with Clomid plus anastrozole. And again, I use it every other day because you truly don't want to have undetectable estrogen levels in these patients. Why? Very nice study done by Finkelstein in 2013, where he took a whole bunch of college kids in Boston and castrated them chemically by giving them GnRH agonist in cohort one and GnRH agonist plus Arimidex and testosterone back in cohort two. Beautiful study to show that in men who got both uh, anastrozole along with testosterone versus those that got testosterone had worsened sexual desire and worsened erectile function, showing that it, even in men, estrogen is very critical for both erectile function and libido. You can't just give out an astrozole. You can't say estrogen is not good for you and decrease it. Most importantly, important for bone health as well, basically both the bone's health. So elevated estrogen is certainly associated with libido in men on testosterone therapy. This is a study again that we did in Baylor where we showed that estrogen was an independent predictor of libido in men taking testosterone therapy. So as much as we want to use our Remedex and decrease the estrogen, don't make it undetectable. You need to have it within the normal range uh, before uh, even in men. And this is an important point that I want to stress. So who is not the appropriate candidate for medical therapy? In a guy that has normal testosterone level, useless. In a guy that has normal LH level, useless. His pituitary, his testes functioning very well. We don't need to treat him on medications. Should not be given Clomid, certainly not an astrozole in these patients. Very important, please understand low T, low LH indication for Clomid, um, high E and altered T2E ratio and indication for an astrozole. Other than that, you shouldn't be giving Clomid to everybody that walks into the office. Yeah. Again, Clomid not indicated in this patient just because he has a normal T level. So if you go back to our patient, this was the level, and certainly Clomid is indicated in these patients with low T and low LH. So the point that I'm trying to make, and this is, uh, we'll digress a little bit to discuss about research, we're all trying to measure intratesticular testosterone. I think that's what I've been stressing about. Premal Patel was my fellow last year, basically put together a nice review showing that both insul 3 and 17-hydroxy progesterone what is 17-hydroxyprogesterone? As urologists, we know this very well. Marker that's used to diagnose congenital adrenal hyperplasia in patients with 21-alpha-hydroxylase deficiency, showing that 17-OHP a is a precursor to testosterone. And so therefore, these patients, if we can measure it in the serum, we can actually identify what the intratesticular testosterone level is. Going back to our first case, Ali, one of the uh, residents at University of Miami, put together the very nice case report showing how 17-OHP can be used to monitor spermatogenesis and spermatogenic uh, processes in patients with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. So John Amory uh, in 2008 used this for a contraception study where he associated serum 17-hydroxyprogesterone on the x-axis with intratesticular testosterone, where he went and biopsied testes and sampled testes as he gave men HCG. Remember, HCG improves intratesticular testosterone and showed a very nice association between 17-OHP and intratesticular testosterone from testicular sampling. Tiago Lima from Brazil is my fellow this year and working with Premal Patel, put together a very nice study that was published in Journal of Urology last month, showing that the, if you give uh, 17-OHP in men who take exogenous testosterone therapy, the 17-OHP level decreases. Whereas in men who receive either clomiphene citrate and or HCG, you see that the 17 OHP increases. So again, very nice biomarker for intratesticular testosterone. We want to start implementing this in routine practice because serum testosterone has issues. It's variable, it's unreliable. In men taking exogenous testosterone, you sort of can't tell if what percentage is coming from inside the testis versus what's coming from the serum. And so therefore, this is a very nice marker that we can use to evaluate intratesticular testosterone 
without actually having to sample the testis or do testis biopsies and evaluate this in the serum. This is unpublished data that he's just submitted to a journal. Remember, I, we talked about we don't know who's going to respond to Clomid whenever we give Clomid to men. And in an attempt to identify whether there is a threshold for who will respond to spermatogenesis after giving Clomid, Tiago was able to identify a level of less than 55. So 17 OHP, if less than 55, were better responders to medical therapy in improving spermatogenesis. So very nice concept that men with lower intratesticular testosterone, i.e. lower 17 OHP in the serum, appear to respond better by improving their spermatogenesis when given medical therapy. I'd love to take questions after this case, so thank you. Dr. Masterson. Okay. Uh, so first one, uh, why are we looking at LH and not FSH in hypogonadism? It's an excellent question. The definition of hypogonadism is actually based only on LH. FSH is not considered when you're making diagnoses of hypogonadism. Remember, testosterone is dependent only on LH. If you have uh, low LH and low T, you got secondary hypogonadism. You have high LH and low T, you got primary hypogonadism. FSH is a good marker of metagenesis, but definitely should not be evaluated when you're making the diagnosis of hypogonadism. And when diagnosing non-obstructive azoospermia, what parameters do you use and what level of FSH do you consider high? So I think the, I think the uh, best uh, example uh, was done, the study was done by Craig Niederberger in 2002 with Dr. Shore, evaluating testis size and FSH. I think in men with small testes and very high FSH, very high meaning greater than eight or 10 based on your normal value, you should be thinking about non-obstructive azoospermia. In men who have normal FSH levels, you could have obstruction or non-obstructive azoospermia. And in those patients, according to guidelines, doing a simple office testis biopsy or a TESA to find out whether they have spermatogenesis or not to distinguish obstructive versus non-obstructive processes are probably the best idea. All right, the next question I have to interpret a little bit. Um, why is 5.2 considered low? I'm assuming they're talking about uh, LH, even, or Possibly yeah. FSH, even yeah. though uh, it is LA. yeah. it's within the reference value. Um, what would you be, what is the desired value? Perfect. That's an excellent question. All that the LH of five and the testosterone of 270 is informing you is that when the testes are not making testosterone, the pituitary needs to respond, needs to kick in, hit the gas pedal and give you more LH. And it's not. And that's why you need support with Clomid. That's why you may need support with anestrozole to move their HPG axis along. And so even though it's, no, it's within the reference range of normal, it just indicates the pituitary is not responding well, and so therefore would qualify for a diagnosis of secondary hypogonadism. Is there a cutoff LH where you would not prescribe Clomid? Um, anything greater than 10, just like we spoke about FSH, I don't think I'd give Clomid. Uh, would you consider giving Clomid to a patient with low 17 OHP and normal serum testosterone. Completely empiric. This is experimental. We're studying this now in, uh, at the University of Miami. We're still trying to determine responders versus non-responders. We're trying to determine how reliable 17 OHP <laughs> is as a blood test. And so until we uh, completely figure that out, I think it's tough, uh, at least for all legal purposes. I think if you have a normal testosterone level now, giving someone Clomid, probably not such a great idea unless you document it very well, and the, low, and the 17 OHP is very low. If the 17 OHP is very low and there is normal serum testosterone, the one thing that you want to absolutely rule out is exogenous use. And if they're taking exogenous testosterone, try and stop that first before you start thinking about giving them Clomid. All right. Uh, how long do you give Clomid treatment and do you stop at a certain estradiol level? Great question. So the, the longest I've kept patients for to see if spermatogenesis improves or not is about three to six months. And um, I don't really stop the Clomid if the estrogen goes high. If the estrogen is greater than 60 picograms per ml, I usually add Arimidex one milligram weekly. If the estrogen is between 60 to 80, uh, then I um, one milligram weekly, 80 to or higher, one milligram two times a week or up to even three times a week. 
So I don't stop the clomid, I just add the anastrozole on top of it. Okay. Uh, do you use elevated LH after clomiphene therapy as a marker to decide whether to adjust the dosage? Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it basically tells you that they're, that they're responding, right? So if you do 25 milligram every other day and the LH has gone up, then they're responding. If you do 25 milligram every other day and the LH isn't responding, then you have to question whether they're taking it or not. And if they are taking it and they swear by it, then you can certainly go up to 50 every other day to try and improve the pituitary response. All right. And will you use Clomid in secondary hypogonadism and high FSH? That's great. That's exactly the question, the case that we saw, correct? The FSH was 15, LH was 5, testosterone was 270. I think we gave them Clomid, right? Because I made the decision based on LH and testosterone rather than what the FSH level was. All right, and that's it. All right, great questions. Um, and then let's move on to our uh, last case of the day. A uh, 26-year-old male uh, with a 24-year-old female. They've been trying to uh, achieve pregnancy. They're now referred from the IVF center. Semen analysis showed azoospermia, no sperm. First case, there was half a million. Second case, there was four to six million. Third case, no sperm. This is where they... IVF specialists, reproductive endocrinologists, gynecologists needs the urologist. They are going to send you these patients and you need to know how to manage these patients very well. As much as azoospermia can be a nightmare, this is the one infertility consult that you absolutely need to deal with because now they need to get sperm in order to proceed with the assisted reproduction cycle that they're planning for. He's young, he's healthy, he's never used um, any medications. His uh, surgical history is none, no, medic, no medical problems. Physical exam, six CC tested. Very small, uh, doesn't want to admit to anything. So then you do blood work and his FSH is undetectable. His LH is undetectable, similar to our first case. But his testosterone is 480, not similar to our first case. First case was 25 and now it's 480. And his 17 OHP, which we got, was 22. This is a great question. Somebody asked me this question. What happens in patients who have low 17 OHP and high serum testosterone? So when you have this discrepancy that the endogenous testosterone is very low and the serum testosterone is high normal here, then you should think about exogenous use. And this is where I think 17 OHP is very reliable as a marker where it'll tell you that the endogenous production of testosterone is impaired. And so you dig a little bit more detail and they tell you they've been taking uh, testosterone cypionate injections, intramuscular injections, 200 milligrams IM every week uh, for the last 10 years. And nobody ever told them that was a contraceptive. They got it from, an, um, from a clinic uh, called Men's Health Clinic, and they didn't think this was a medication. They didn't think they needed to admit this as a medication. They didn't tell his wife. And so everybody was pretty unhappy that he was using something that was causing him potentially to have azoospermia and a uh, bad, again, bad dire situation that you now have to uh, deal with just the family, the IVF center, and the patient. So you repeat the semen analysis just to make sure, and it comes back with a normal semen volume, but azoospermia with no, con no sperm uh, seen in the specimen. So Raul Clavijo was my first fellow. He put together this very nice um, algorithm. He's at UC Davis now on men who take testosterone supplementation. One of the first things that you want to do is uh, stop the testosterone. Uh, you evaluate the baseline hormones as well as the semen analysis. We did this, right? We saw what the T was, we saw what the SA was, and he's azoospermic. In these patients, the first step to do is to give them both Clomid and ACG. And there's rationale for both. Clomid, you want to boost the FSH and the LH and can boost spermatogenesis. Whereas the HCG is to boost intratesticular testosterone and try and keep their testosterone levels pretty high. Because this guy has been using injections, 200 milligrams every week for the last 10 years. If you take them off everything and put them just on Clomid or leave them with nothing, he's going to crash and they're going to be unhappy. And he's going to start using testosterone without telling his wife or you for that matter. And so in these patients, you want to make sure you provide adequate support for their testes to make testosterone. You bring them back at three months and you check a sperm analysis and repeat the hormones. And if the FSH is still undetectable, then at that point you can stop the Clomid 
and start the FSH and HCG. Because in five to 10% of patients, not only are the testicles shut, the pituitary is shut and doesn't recover. So it's very important to know that you give the pituitary a chance by using Clomid and HCG. And if it doesn't work, you can add FSH later on. And here, I use the dose of Clomid of 50 every other day, much higher dose compared to the 25 in the men with idiopathic infertility, because here you're restarting something uh, from the ground zero. Whereas over there, the FSH was there, the LH were there, you're just trying to increase it a little bit. Here you need to go from undetectable to normal levels. And this is where I use 50. And even here, I use the every other day dosing as opposed to the every day dosing uh, because the half-life of Clomid is so long and you don't need such high levels of estrogen on a daily basis. So steroid-induced hypogonadism and infertility, uh, the Clomid uh, 50 plus HCG, uh, and you bring them back in three months. I brought him back in about three months, and we showed uh, that he had sperm back in his ejaculate, just one million, just one million moving sperm in his ejaculate. But listen, it was better than zero. There were three semen analyses that were done that were zero, and the uh, wife was very happy. The uh, reproductive endocrinologist was very happy. Uh, they went on to do an IVF cycle after freezing that sperm, and the, and the wife got pregnant and is now pregnant at six months. So very nice story, uh, but certainly important to understand that here we used Clomid and HCG as opposed to just HCG and or FSH. And for you, you have to understand that if the pituitary and the hypothalamus is functioning just fine, then you should be using both Clomid and HCG. If it's not functioning, then you should use HCG and or FSH like in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. That's why it's so important to make the diagnosis properly because that was what is going to guide uh, medical therapy properly. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and teach a concept that is very new uh, because of a, a study that we just finished now at the University of Miami. And for all practical purposes, board answers, uh, regular clinical practice, I want everyone to take away this message. Testosterone is a contraceptive and should not be used in men who desire fertility. Libor Ramos is my nurse practitioner and put together this because we see so many men who come into our clinic with this exact same story who don't know that testosterone therapy is a contraceptive and don't know that they shouldn't be using it if they're trying to have kids and therefore uh, should remain as such. And if you want me to add a caveat to this and switch just a little bit around, is I want to educate all of you today to tell you that long acting testosterone is probably a contraceptive. And what is the difference? And do we have any evidence behind this? So we did a single center open label clinical trial using nasal testosterone, Nitesto. Uh, it is FDA approved in 2012, where you need to use it three times a day. So not easy as uh, pellets or injections that are used less frequently, but really three times a day. Uh, it's a gel delivery system. There's no risk of transference. And one of the initial abstracts that were presented at the AUA several years ago uh, by Dr. Morgenthaler's group showed that the LH and FSH actually remained within normal limits in men who were taking the testo on the clinical trial. Interesting pharmacokinetic pattern to understand that the levels go very high within the first hour or two, and by about hour four to six, the levels are back to baseline. And so very different pharmacokinetics compared to other testosterone delivery systems that we have currently on the market. Tom Masterson's here and initiated the trial here at the University of Miami, where we recruited a total of uh, 40 men uh, with idiopathic hypogonadism, uh, men between age 18 to 55. They could not have used any testosterone therapy. Uh, their total motile sperm count had to be more than 5 million, right? So I didn't, we didn't really take men who were infertile, didn't take men who were oligospermic, uh, but men who had uh, greater than 5 million on two baseline semen analyses uh, to evaluate what the effect of Natesto would be in men who want to preserve fertility. And this is the data. So this uh, was just published uh, this month, actually, in the Journal of Urology, uh, where on the top part, we see hormones, testosterone. Natesto is able to reliably increase their testosterone levels when checked within one hour of administration. We see uh, that the, the trend remains at three and six months. So interestingly, in a guy that was taking testosterone cipionate, he, his FSH and his LH were undetectable, right? So in patients who take exogenous testosterone therapy, you should see this level drop down to zero. But interestingly, we saw a decline and a statistically significant decline in FSH and in LH, but we see that the levels 
do not go below normal in majority of the men. And this is probably the most interesting piece of data that we had is that total mortal sperm count. Yes, we do see a decline at three and six months. This is the longest data that we have and certainly long-term studies need to be done if we want to continue Natesto in men for a very long time, but certainly very encouraging data to show that majority of men, 90 to 95% of men actually maintain their sperm counts at three and at six months. Very few patients became azoospermic, but the few that became azoospermic all recovered on their own or sometimes with clomiphene citrate, uh, but certainly very encouraging data to show the short acting testosterone therapy may not be a contraceptive compared to long acting uh, testosterone therapy and certainly should be something that we should all be thinking about when we are treating these young guys who wish to preserve fertility who have normal sperm counts. Very different from clomiphen, where we are trying to induce and stimulate spermatogenesis. Natesto can maintain spermatogenesis. It will certainly not improve your spermatogenesis, but clomid should be used in the setting where we want to increase sperm counts rather than just maintain their sperm counts. Obviously, the future is in stem cells. It's about, this is uh, pervaded into just about every field in medicine and urology. Um, Himanshu Aurora, working in the lab with us, published a very nice paper uh, where we did autographs of uh, stem cells obtained from mice uh, under the skin. And we actually demonstrated that at two months, we're able to see viable stem cells within the skin. And certainly the testosterone levels in these animals increased uh, when they were castrated showing that the autograft can actually uh, produce testosterone on their own. So I think to summarize, uh, we did uh, three uh, different cases, all three uh, with different uh, types of uh, management. Certainly important for all of us to understand, you gotta get the diagnosis right. If you get the diagnosis wrong, you're just gonna be chasing your tail and making mistakes and losing the patient. The first patient was this young guy with hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, we gave him HCG. You can follow the serum 17 OHP along to titrate the, testo to the HCG. And certainly thinking about long-term testosterone therapy after his fertility goals are achieved, excellent idea. There were lots of questions on using HCG long-term, totally okay. As long as the cost is not an issue and injecting themselves once or twice a week is not an issue, certainly discuss that with the patients. In the second case, we saw the young couple with a low sperm count that was attempting to achieve conception and using clomiphene citrate and or anastrozole in patients to increase uh, testosterone is certainly an option. One thing that you can discuss if the testosterone is normal and they want to improve their testosterone level, I think giving them HCG is certainly an option for men who have normal T levels. And in the last case, we saw the bodybuilder who was using testosterone for many years, uh, giving him clomiphene citrate and HCG together to maintain and get spermatogenesis back with recovery is an excellent option. And lastly, this is clearly a clinical trial, very preliminary data, but certainly paradigm shifting to show that nasal testosterone with short acting uh, testosterone therapy is probably a good idea for men who have low testosterone, but want to maintain their sperm counts rather than improve or induce spermatogenesis. Uh, these are my contact info with uh, Twitter handles and Instagram, and I'm happy to take questions for the remaining seven minutes that we have. Great. Um, so I, I think you reiterated this, but uh, just to clarify, why do you give both HCG and Clomid at the same time in this case? Great question. So I think the, um, the Clomid is for boosting the spermatogenesis. It is to improve and stimulate FSH uh, to get the spermatogenesis back. If the guy has been using only testosterone for a very short time, you don't need the HCG. But clomid's going to take a while to start working. And in those patients that have been using them for a long time, giving them HCG to sort of support for their testosterone levels, at least for the first three months, is probably a good idea. Uh, why do you not use Clomid 50 every day? Um, and can you explain your dosage? And do you always start with 25 every other day? So. Um, the everyday dosing is not necessary because of the half-life. The clomid has a very long half-life. If a drug that has a long half-life, you don't need to give it frequently because steady state levels are achieved very well, even if you use it less frequently, just pharmacokinetics. And the 50 every other day I use in men who have no LH and no FSH, where they've, their pituitary and their hypothalamus is completely shut down. 
And in those patients, I certainly uh, start with 50 every other day. In the second case where we saw that the LH was four, five, where you just needed to increase it just a bit more, then half the dose is enough. Because Clomid is an estrogen and you're giving estrogen to men. And I showed you about all of the side effects of decreasing estrogen and increasing estrogen. And I think we need to be very careful uh, when we're treating men with Clomid uh, because it's an estrogen and you want to play with and you want to use it very carefully. So 25 every other day, most cases should be okay. Certainly if you don't see a pituitary response with the LH, then increasing their dose is probably a good idea. Uh, would count have improved with continued HCG and Clomid and obviate the need for assistive reproductive techniques? Excellent question. So I think the answer to that question is testis volume. If you have a guy with good testis volume, just like we saw in the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, um, you, can, you can certainly wait for the counts to improve. His testis volume was 6 EC. That means he's lost a lot of germ cells. I think it's very difficult to repopulate germ cells and increase testis volume enough to get normal spermatogenesis. But you also have to understand the situation where you now have a desperate wife who's very upset and a reproductive endocrinologist who's unhappy because the guy has not told anybody that he's been using testosterone causing azospermia. So in those patients, you wanna let them proceed with IVF if they can, if they can't, and that's not such a, and, and or money is an issue, certainly continuing them on Clomid HCG, attempting natural conception, uh, fantastic idea. There's no reason to uh, rush to ART. And certainly kit number two, right? You, this, is, this is just for the first kit. And if they want to come back and have another one, and if the guy wants to come off of testosterone therapy and just maintain him I'm on Clomid HCG, probably a very good idea. Uh, what do you mean by secondary hypogonadism? And I think this is also in reference to you know, secondary hypogonadism versus hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism. I think I clarified that point, but I'm very happy to, uh, to state that again. So in hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, the hypothalamus and the pituitary connection is absent. The neurons are absent. So GnRH produced by the hypothalamus do not reach the pituitary gland to make LH and FSH. And so therefore they have undetectable LH, undetectable FSH. And in those patients, you cannot treat them with medications like nastrozole and clomiphen to try and improve their gonadotropins. Whereas those patients need hormonal support with FSH and LH. Secondary hypogonadism, that's the study that John Masterson's published showing that men with low LH, meaning the LH is four, they have a well-functioning hypothalamus and a pituitary, just not as good. And the testosterone is low. And so those patients have secondary hypogonadism and those patients need to be treated or can be treated with clomiphene citrate to try and boost their LH and boost their intratesticular testosterone production. Another one, uh, COVID appears to be a prothrombotic disease. Do you have any concerns about using HCG clomid testosterone uh, in the current pandemic? Mm, very good question. Never gotten that question before. Uh, yes, I think you should be thinking about uh, all of the downstream effects of COVID. We are going to see patients uh, with uh, COVID and impaired spermatogenesis, uh, impaired testosterone production, uh, because the ACE2 receptor that the COVID virus binds to is present in two important cells. And it's very prevalent in the testis, in the Sertoli cells and in the Leydig cells. And if truly COVID binds to both Leydig cells and Sertoli cells, I think downstream long-term sequelae of COVID, of COVID, I think we are going to see men with hypogonadism, uh, low testosterone, as well as impaired spermatogenesis. So yes, you have to be cautious. Uh, situation is very fluid. We don't, data is being gathered as we speak, uh, but that's something that I think we should definitely think about. All right. Uh, and this question, definitely it is outside the context, but uh, varicocele with recurrent IVF failure, normal essay, unexplained infertility. Uh, do you fix the varicocele? Only if it is a large varicocele and if the DNA fragmentation is abnormal. And you also want to define why recurrent IVF failure is not because of fertilization failure, but because of failure of embryo progression or implantation, then I think about going and fixing the varicocele. All right. Uh, 
Uh, and that's it for all of the questions. All right, I'd love to uh, thank uh, the UCSF and the uh, COVID collaboration uh, for giving us this opportunity. Thanks Dr. Masterson for uh, moderating the session, uh, but thank you all for listening. I know these are difficult times, but if there are any questions and I'm happy to help answer, either send me an email or uh, DM me on Instagram. And thank you very much.